Is this a dream? No, it's not a dream. I'm an angel. Why would God send me an angel? Because God knows that everyone needs a little coaching now and then. I'm loving angels. I saw an angel. All angels say from you. Being touched by an angel, girl. Hi, and welcome to the Super Angel Podcast, the go to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our community at eu.vc. Today, we're happy to welcome you to Bjarke, a founder turned VC turned angel. Bjarke co founded an algorithmic trading company before startups were even cool then worked at Creandum, where he invested in Plio, Bolt, and Trade Republic. For the past three years, he's been an active angel investor with a portfolio of 30 companies in fintech and SaaS across Europe. If you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. And now, some words from our beloved sponsor. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Vaban's end-to-end platform automates your back office so you can focus on what matters, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and they've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, Vaban will be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on the Vaban platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investment for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. If you'd like to learn more, please check out www.vaban.io forward slash EUVC. Bjarke, welcome so much to the Super Angel podcast. It's great to have a fellow Dane with us here today. Thank you very much for having me. Really exciting. Thanks for joining the pod, Bjarke. Really excited to hear your perspectives, having been a founder, then PC, and now an angel investor. But uh, let's get started, actually. Do you want to share your story with the listeners and maybe what got you into angel investing in the first place? I started my career, uh, I guess, somewhat conservatively in 2006 at uh, McKinsey, worked as a management consultant for a bit, then worked at Global Stacks on the trading floor. And then I had to quit after not very long to start a company with two high school friends. It's a company called uh, Olympus that literally no one has heard of, uh, almost no one. What we did was we looked at how news were impacting financial markets, stocks, bonds, exchange rates, all that stuff. And clearly news impact uh, financial assets quite a lot. And also most news are released in text form, press releases uh, specifically. So what I could see from my job at Goldman and sort of looking at at different data was that it looked like not only were news very important for the price of financial assets, but also all these news were reacted to manually by people just because it took quite a long time for the prices to actually react. And a long time, I meant like 10 seconds or five seconds. And this was just around the time when what we now call natural English processing was becoming sort of good enough to be useful. So we decided to build a company that would trade automatically based on the news flow. I'm by no means the first to say this, but like starting a company is really tough. Like it's by far the toughest thing that, that, that I've done, at least professionally. Uh, in the first two or three years after we started, we were like constantly scared shiftless that we wouldn't get it to work or that we would be run out by, by a big competitor or something like that. We also had like a lot of components to our uh, system, like the business that all had to work flawlessly <laughs> unless every single one of them did, like the entirety of it did work. So sometimes it felt like we had invented the most complicated way to make money in the world, uh, which was quite frustrating. Uh, but luckily we kept fighting and at some point, so one and a half, two years in, it suddenly started working, which was obviously an amazing experience to have. And then we had some very exciting years of, of lots of growth. We hired our first employee, which was only after we got it to work. So very unlike uh, what people do today. We also never really raised any money, which is sort of why we couldn't hire people. We then built a, a proper team. Uh, a lot of them are actually still with us and obviously expanded it. So this company is still alive and well. It's doing better than ever, actually. I haven't been active in a couple of years now, but uh, I'm still a big shareholder. And I'm still very good sort of friends with uh, my co-founders. And now sort of finally after, like it's, it's almost it's around 14 years since we started it, it's actually like an outcome now that a VC would be quite happy with. We never raised VC money, but for a long time, it felt like we were sort of going so slow. But at the same time, we're growing like 30, 40% a year, which in other industries is a lot. When our company started making some money, we sort of dipped our seat, me and my two co-founders, in angel investing. I think we did one deal, which didn't amount to anything. 
like the company. <laughs> it was a good one. But through that, I, I started meeting people in the startup scene. Uh, we had always been quite separate from the startup scene when we were starting the company, where we never, we never went to meetups. Like, no one invited us to for dinners and stuff like that. We were just working, honestly. Going to these sort of events in the startup scene, I met the good people at Crandon for a venture fund. And I eventually joined them. Uh, with the Stockholm, I spent four years there, which was fantastic. And I was also fortunate to work with some really great companies there, including Clio, Trade Public, uh, and Boat. And about three years ago, I left and moved back to Denmark, uh, where I'm now based, which is also where I'm originally from. Uh, and I've been very uh, investing uh, since then. You know, having had the experience of being a founder is parallel to nothing, right? And, and that's something very unique to bring to the table, both as a value add to the companies you, you invest into, but also as a, as a lens, as an investor. But one more thing I wanted to double click on is like, what got you initially itching into angel investing? Was it people around you you wanted to support or what was that? And then maybe after that, would love, you know, having, having done angel investing now for some years, if you want to share a few of the deals or some of the memorable deals you've done. I'm incredibly privileged that I get to do this. Uh, at least I feel so. I think being an indoor investor is, is the best job uh, in the world. Um, so it wasn't like a, a hard decision to do it. And at the same time, in a lot of ways, it was was like a natural continuation of, of working as a VC that when I decided to leave that, okay, let, let me sort of do the same type of job roughly without investors, of course, but still sort of spending time with founders, helping them out and, and uh, hopefully investing in the best ones. And then I think uh, a benefit of being an angel versus a VC is that you can approach it in a, like a more collaborative and less competitive way uh, versus other investors. Well, because you're such a small ticket on the cap table, you almost never compete with others. I mean, you still sometimes... A lot of times you need to fight to be into the best deals, but you can be extremely collaborative and sort of share everything with a bunch of people and then they share stuff back to it. I really enjoyed that aspect of the job. Actually, my most memorable deal was when I was still with Grandom. Exactly the, the last deal that I did while I was there. And so and as it was closing, I, I had sort of decided to quit. So I gave it to Johan, one of my colleagues, who has then supported the team amazingly uh, over this fantastic journey. But it, it started quite randomly that I had sort of a, like an ad hoc chat with a a German pre-seed fund uh, who mentioned this company and I, I wasn't really covering Germany so it wasn't obvious that I should be the one to pick it up but at the same time I, I'd spent like a lot of time in uh, financial markets technology uh, so it felt like you know, this is a deal that I should be able to assess quite well. So I reached out, uh, I spoke to Christian, the CEO and the team and they were like super impressive but it was still, it was like a really weird deal at the time. Like uh, it, it wasn't at all one of the hot deals in Germany. Uh, I'm not totally sure about this but most of the Berlin funds had like they hadn't even really seen it or they had like passed without even talking to them. And there was, despite sort of the team being really impressive, there was a lot to dislike. Like uh, very hard uh, working smart founders, but also founders who had spent three years and upwards of like 10 million euros building a full bank without actually having launched anything. It was like, it was weird, right? That people, oh, people so for why? But then sort of it was lucky that because it wasn't a hot deal, there wasn't that much time pressure as, as what we see nowadays in a lot of deals. So we spend a lot of time with the team. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the infrastructure and I can attest that, that you know, uh, uh, launching a broker in Europe uh, from an infrastructure perspective is super fucking hard. Like uh, there are so many partnerships you need to have and they don't want to partner with you unless you're, you know, a billion dollar bank. And it's, it's really tough. And they had sort of pulled this off, which in itself was really impressive. At the end, our, our biggest concern was actually about the market. Uh, like pre trade Republic, Germans didn't really buy stocks. Like uh, this, you could look at the data, like this was the case. Like if you look at stock ownership in, you know, the US or UK or Denmark or any other country versus Germany, Germany was like, you know, one tenth the level or something. So we were pretty concerned actually that even though the team is great, they launched this great product and also no one can copy it because the infrastructure is so hard that they were just going to launch in a totally dead market that no one would actually use it. Luckily that turned out to be wrong and then the team has executed phenomenally well and the company has since raised like a billion euros from some of the best clients in the world. And I must say, you know, COVID, I'm sure, has accelerated the education of people into, into the stock market as well, right? So sometimes it takes some tailwinds beyond. Um, but yeah, what a story. And I can attest to the, the less shininess of the team. You're right. A lot of VCs, I think, were passing or not even taking that call. So kudos to you for, for seeing that. And then I guess looking back as now having been angel investing for a bit, like, what would you say angel investing kind of gives you both personally and professionally, right? And I mean, why do you do it? <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the best job in the world. It, it sort of lets me do a lot of things that are really exciting. One, one thing is that I spend most of my time talking to really exceptional people 
talking about the things that they are most passionate about in the world, which is their business. I also get to spend a lot of my time uh, like really doing you know deep thinking about you know, business and business models and you know individuals also. I right? like what, what makes sense should I invest in this or not. So from an intellectual perspective, it's all really exciting. And there is still this like competitive element to it, uh, even if it's much less competitive than than being a VC. I still oftentimes need to fight to go to get into the good deals, which is exciting, right? And it's fun to do something where you're not sure you're going to succeed uh, every day. And then finally, and like hopefully this this is this is the case. I get to like help these founders make their businesses even better, which is I think very exciting as well. Oh no, not about the thesis. But before we start, let's dive into the very you know overview and tell us exactly. First of all, of course, investment thesis meaning sector, stage, all that but also size of portfolio now and what you're trying to build and so on. Absolutely. In a lot of ways, I, I try to run my angel portfolio in a way that's similar to how a VC would do it in terms of, of cadence and, and uh, focus. I've done about 30 investments, in like direct investments as an angel. I've also invested in five VC funds uh, in addition to that. Usually my investment size is 20 to 50,000 euros, roughly like that. I'm mainly uh, active in the Nordics, so Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. But I have a couple of deals in Germany and a couple of deals in the UK as well. And my main focus in terms of sector is fintech, where I've just spent so much of my career in that, in that space, uh, and also B2B SaaS, or where I just feel that I'm able to properly assess whether something makes sense or not, much more so than, for instance, like a, a social app, which I, I think is, is, is much harder, at least for me, to properly assess. And state-wise, I mainly do pre-seed and seed. But I, I love to invest very early. So uh, I've invested in, in, in many people that... Literally, we're just starting out when I missed. I mean, you mentioned uh, the focus on the Nordics. I mean, how do you think about proximity to the ecosystem vis-a-vis kind of coverage, sourcing, and why have you chosen to be so focused? There's sort of a, a positive and a negative spin to that in terms of like uh, geography. The positive spin is that it's easier to be plugged in uh, when you're physically there. You naturally know many more people, which means you have a better way of both getting access like knowing about deals, but also doing reference checks with, with people about founders. The, the negative spin is that most, I think, listeners of this podcast will, will know this, right? But, but private markets has this notion of access uh, that public like listed markets don't have, right? So, so if I listed shares in the US, I, can, I may not make sort of as good decisions as you know, Citadel or some big hedge fund, but I can buy the same shares they can at the same price they can. In private markets, that's just not the case, right? I mean, I, I may not even know about what the good deal is. And even if I know about it, I, I may not get in. It's just much easier to know what the good deals are and also get into the good deals in a geography that you're focused on. Because you've built this network, people will have heard about you or they know someone that knows you, which makes uh, everything much easier. I'd love to ask, though, because I remember us having a conversation where you said, hmm. I am looking a bit more outside of the Nordics and it's a bit, uh, you know, I'm kind of trying to figure out exactly how do I want to, you know, approach these markets and, and both in terms of how much exposure you want, but also how will you access them? So I'd love to hear your reflections on that. Where does the interest in even going outside of the Nordics come from? And also how have you then thought about doing it? So I think the, the interest is very basic in that I, I want to invest in the best companies that I like to invest in. And those companies may be in the Nordics, but they may be elsewhere. I also, like, I have bandwidth to do more than the Nordics. So, like, I've, I've had the Nordics pretty much covered now and know what's going on here. And I still have time to do more things. The big challenge is to avoid this negative selection bias that comes from this, you know, access point that I, that I mentioned earlier. And I think the way I approach it is that I try to be quite focused meaning, if you're a fintech founder, you will probably benefit more from having on your cap table than if you're a gaming founder. So I only want to do deals outside of my geography that I know where, where I know the space. I also try to sort of focus somewhat narrowly uh, from a geographical perspective. So for instance, it feels like London, Paris, Berlin are very competitive and there are not so very, there's like a very strong local ecosystem through these markets that is a bit hard to penetrate unless you're there. Whereas some of the smaller geographies, uh, Amsterdam, Brussels, for instance, uh, are sort of easier to get into as a, a support. I try to be very clear about what my value add is and why founders should have more on their cap table. Um, and this is, you know, always the case, but but uh, even more so here. And and that's actually probably the thing that I work the most on in terms of like how I run my business is 
how can I make this value add as, as clear uh, as possible? It's funny because for like 95% of companies, uh, like the bottom 95% of companies, being value add is not that hard. It, it's a little bit brutal to say so, but like the bottom 95% of companies saying, like giving like sort of fairly mundane advice, uh, like uh, do fewer things or talk to more customers is actually going to be bad work. Like uh, they will, I mean, say, oh, this is great advice. I'm going to do that. And then they will become a better company because of that. The, the problem is that venture and startup investing, angel investing has this counter no, when it comes to returns. So almost all the returns are actually in the top 5% of, of companies. Uh, and those are some of the companies that I want to invest in. So what I think a lot about is like, okay, how do I then bring value to the top 5%? And, and telling the top 5% of companies to do fewer things is oftentimes not that valuable. Maybe it is, but most of the time it's hot because they know what they're doing. So what I then try to focus on is two things. One is, is quite basic, which is that if you're selling to, to tech companies, I can give you 10 like, very qualified leads. I can't guarantee that they will be customers, but I can give you sort of intros to potential customers that will have a conversation with you, and especially at like pre-seed stage, but don't have a product yet. That can be very valuable in terms of just accelerating knowledge. And the second point is that... Uh, through my background as a VC, I hope at least that I can bring value when it comes to fundraising. And this is simply because even the best founders, they haven't got that much experience in fundraising. And, and even though I've mainly seen it from the other side of the table, I've just seen so many pitch decks, listen to so many founders pitch, and even you know, some of the best ones in, in Europe, that I, I have a pretty good sense of what, what good looks like. So I tend to be, if the companies want it, some companies, they just you know, do it without me, and that's totally fine. Right? But for the companies that want it, I... I can be quite involved in that process, both in terms of, of helping with the actual material, like what should be in the deck, what should we say, what shouldn't we say, what should we talk less about. There's usually a lot of value in, in, in saying fewer things and, and being more crisp and succinct. Uh, and also, how should I run the process? Making sure that we get as many sort of competitive, like as much competitive interest from different VCs as possible. I would love to ask you the question, Bjarke, because you said you're now at 30 investments, and that is somewhat where we start seeing an inflection point in people's investment portfolio that now it's getting tough to actually be able to deliver on that value add. I'm curious to hear, you know, how you're thinking about that and how you're thinking going forward. Are you, are you, will you keep adding, you know, if we say, you know, five, 10 investments per year, or will you dial it down a bit? How are you thinking about it? So I've, I've done around 10 investments per year for the past couple of years. Uh, so I did 11 last year. I've done one so far this year and, and one more in the making. And I tend to, to keep that cadence. I hope, and this hasn't, I mean, really been proven yet, but, but my ambition is that the companies, the ones that, you know, survive and perform, that they outgrow the need for my help at some point. Meaning, and I think a company like Monsa, which is a, a, like an EV uh, chanting platform, a company that I've invested in at the seed stage, they've raised like $50 million since then, roughly. From, from really good investors. They don't need my help in. Like they have a great board, they have professional you know, VCs, board members, I cannot bring more to the table. And that's fine. So then I can sort of shift my focus to the earlier stage companies, my portfolio and, and So I hope that there will be sort of an equilibrium where that I do deals every year. Some deals don't make it. That's always the case. Some deals make it and then they sort of uh, outgrow their need for, for my advice. I'd love to ask both of you a question here. How the hell do you deal with a poorly performing company? Because you, in a way, should just say, okay, forget about it. It's not going to be the one big returner. So I might not spend more time. This may be even more for, for Anthony than you, given that that you can still be happy with a 2x or just getting the money back, whereas Anthony really needs the, the, the big hits for his portfolio model to work. So I'd love to hear both of you, how do you deal with that situation both? And how do you make sure that the uh, because and we've spoken about this many times on this on this podcast, the importance of, of brand slash reputation amongst founders. So of course, it's also very much a stakeholder relationship, and sometimes you can't do more. But but how do you make sure that when you get to that point, you don't end up in a situation where someone feels that you weren't there for them? I would say there's a couple of principles to that, right? So firstly, also context matters. So you know, within Cocoa, we're for pre-seed, we're a very concentrated uh, fund. For a reason, like we we believe in kind of building long lasting relationships with the founders, but of course, uh, you know we understand that at pre seed the failure rate is higher, right? I think expectations really matter here. Commitment really matters here. When we cross the chasm of making an investment, we're really committing time to the founders. We believe in the founders, right? That's our thesis, and we want to back them for the very long term. 
if things take longer, we're there for them. But we also align expectations that, you know, of course, as a lot of people say, you know, the founders you want to spend most of your time with don't really need you because they're thriving, right? Uh, the founders that you have to spend most of your time with is, I think, a very important thing to do an analysis on. So like which companies are not yet there from a product market fit perspective, but they're executing well and you can put a lot of effort there to support. And then there's the other co companies that are struggling a bit more where the reality is, though, and that's one of the things that I really love personally of this craft is that, well, it's, it's a good and a bad, right? So your contribution to the market, uh, the ROI of it and the feedback loops are long, the ROI of it is not very straightforward. But one thing is for sure that it's a very long-term game. So the type of input you put, uh, no matter what, if it's positive, it comes back to you. So if it's that struggling founder that wasn't there, that, that you weren't there for them while they were struggling, that will come back to you negatively, right? So in the end of the day, maybe the opportunity cost of spending that time with a founder is at the time losing another deal. But the reality is, is you're creating a very deep relationship of trust with that founder. And that founder might end up building something else in the future and you'll definitely be able to support them. And also conversely, the next founder you'll back will ask the founder, you know, how you actually acted when things were not going well. So whether it's for good faith or just optimizing for ROI, like I'm a firm believer that, you, you know, the moment you cross the chasm of investing in those founders, you're there to support them. And then the question is, how do you scale yourself? You know, hopefully the ones that graduate, you know, we're not the lead VC and or but we try to add as much value as we can. But when the next lead VC and the next round comes, already we've ramped up it. And then some of the companies that struggle, we're there to support them until we can. And then at some point, in any ways, like, you know, that, that doesn't go further. And so that's kind of how we think about it. My thoughts are very aligned with what Anthony says. I think the key thing that Anthony said here was expectations management, which I think is, is uh, crucial here. As an angel, to be fair, it is much, easy, much easier. Like people don't expect nearly as much from you when you're an angel and you have like 0.05% of the equity uh, as they do uh, with, a, with a fund. Looking at, at sort of other angels that I've invested in, a lot of angels actually don't do anything. And sometimes you have these angels that, that you, you want to have on your cap table. And I'm, I'm invested in companies where, uh, you know, it's a developer tool and, and there are these sort of kind of unicorn developer tool founders in San Francisco that look great on the cap table on the deck. And so we, we convince them to invest, but they don't spend one second with the company, like literally <laughs> not one second. Sometimes the company, like they haven't even spoken to them. In, in sort of the angel cohort in a company, I am usually, like, I think I'm always in the better half and I'm usually sort of close to the top in terms of, of being value at, at least that's what people tell me. Maybe they're not telling the truth, but that's what they tell me. So sort of the, the baseline is much lower. What I find I can do with these companies that are struggling is much more on emotional support, like being more like a buddy. Let's have a beer and, and talk about, you know, why things suck. And, and then we do that. And then that's usually sort of it. Uh, so so I, like, I haven't seen this being a massive challenge yet. It, it probably will be at some point. But I think, or I hope that sort of this sort of managing expectations, what is it that I bring to the table? I, I'm not going to help you run your business on a day-to-day -day basis because you should do that. Right? It's much better that you do it than, than I do it. And so they don't expect me to do that also. Like, it goes up. The other day I, 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 I chatted to a founder in, uh, in the London ecosystem and Anthony, this is, this is to you because I realized after that in the end of that 20 minute chat that he was actually not in your portfolio, but he was getting a lot of advice from you. And he was like, Anthony is one of my go-to guys when it comes to asking questions uh, and getting guidance. So I really think that to any in our audience listening in that being in the helping hand and the guy at the end of WhatsApp <laughs> to people, even though you haven't invested really uh, does come back. And it isn't just Anthony and Rarke and, and the other super angels that we have on this podcast that, that say it, it, it really is the truth. So I think, you know, if, if you're an angel listening in and, and you aren't practicing that, I think it's worthwhile considering if you should. But Bjarke, you said something before that, that I would love to ask you about, and that is that you're an LP in five funds. And of course, you know, and, and we've talked about that as well, that we do LP syndicates in the belief that we believe that the angels can definitely leverage those relationships more. And Anthony, of course, is a VC built around angels very much. So, so we're very keen to hear why have you chosen to do five LP investments and how do you use them? So I've mainly invested in new managers uh, that I, where, where I sort of I find the people to be very impressive and, and the strategy to be, to be credible. I think investing people that are better than you is a, is a good sort of 
mental model, whether it's founders or VCs, is, it, it doesn't really matter. I also have invested a couple of more established ones that I've been lucky to have been invited to. Usually it's, it's very hard to get into those unless you're yeah, like a big pension fund. I do it for a couple of reasons. One is that I, I generally believe that I will get really good returns from these investments. Like I, I, I seriously think so. I also do it because it's a great way to build a close relationship with those people that, again, are impressive. And I, I sort of, uh, I, 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 I think I can learn from them. And knowing sort of the, the types of deals that they do will help me make better deals myself when it comes to the direct investment side. Also, it'd be supporting people that I admire and that I want to succeed. Out here learning more about them angels, are you? The first lesson that I've made is that if you feel you could add a lot of value, you probably should invest in the company. And and this is somewhat counter to what a lot of angels, like the, the mental load that a lot of angels have, right? That they they do it because they want to be active. They want to, you know, help out and give back and all that stuff. Also, like on an operational level, my experience is that if, if you feel if, yeah, if you feel that, that will be valuable to the company, it's probably not a company you should invest in. And sometimes I also like come across companies where I think it's a great idea or even maybe a great product, but there are a lot of things that I would do different. Like I would have different go to market, I would you know, be more focused or type of a different niche or think differently about hiring and stuff like that. I see a lot of angles are attracted to those deals. Like I can help out. Usually the outcomes are just not very good from those types of deals. And, and the key learning, if you sort of take it a step further, that is that when you're an angel or I think even as a VC, you're never in the driver's seat. Like the founders run the company and the most important thing is find founders that can grow. Like I, I really try to invest in people that I think are way better than me at running what they're doing. And if I don't feel that, then, then I, I try not to invest. A second learning, a little bit counter to the first one, but because of this uh, notion of access that we have in, in these private markets that we also talked about, I think it's important to be clear with yourself or with myself uh, and also with, with the world about why founders should let you uh, onto the cap too. And this sort of goes back to like, what kind of value add can you bring? And, and like, out of 95% of companies, it's quite easy to add value. But what is the value that you can bring to the top 5% of the companies, the companies that you actually want to invest in, the founders who are better than you? Like, why, why would they add to, the, to their cap ticket? And this is, I think, an interesting point, and it's also very different for different people. Like, there are some people, I mentioned this, like some of these unicorn Valve virtual founders, some people are just so high caliber that they get into the best deals in the world just through their name, which is obviously great. And, and it's not because I think founders are stupid for doing this because it actually adds down to have this person on their cap table uh, and they don't need to do anything about it. And that's obviously for those, it, that's great. I'm not one of those people, so I need to do a little bit, bit, bit more work. I think a lot of people that at least should consider to do angel investing that don't do it are like operators at successful tech companies because I think those are the people that are probably have the easiest time adding real value. So like if you're VP sales at a Series B stage startup, you can add a ton of value to a pre-seed state company in terms of how to run sales. And this doesn't mean that you should take over sales or you should you know talk to the founder every day, but just having like a one-hour call where you talk about how should you run this, what does the enterprise sales process look like, all that stuff, can add a ton of value. And, and the thing that I focus on, as I mentioned, is, is this notion of, of very helping with fundraising, where I actually think that I can, I can add some value. The third... The lesson that I have is that I think cooperation is really a superpower. This applies even more as an angel than as a VC. When you're an angel, you, at least typically, and, and that's definitely the case for me, you invest so little money that you don't really compete very much with, definitely not with VCs, and then usually not even with, with other angels. This doesn't mean that you always can get into the good deals because sometimes they are hyper-competitive, but whether you're in or not is not what sort of makes the difference. I think you could and should use that to your advantage. First of all, to sort of not be entirely on your own. Uh, even though the, the job is very social, I talk to people every day, a lot of the day, it can be somewhat lonely because you're sort of a lone warrior trying to find uh, good things in the world. Uh, but if you build a network with other angels, with VCs, uh, you share deals, you have nothing to lose from, from sort of sharing your best deals with, with everyone, then you know they will share stuff with you, they will share insights and research, the VCs will usually do sort of much uh, deeper research than you will ever do as an angel because they have better resources, so you can sort of tap into that. And it's just important, I think, in order to get into the deals that you know what's going on and, and having that network is, is the best way, in my experience, to do that. I love actually the number one and number two. There's actually, if you don't really read between the lines, it seems like a controversy, but I totally get what you mean. I think the, 
The number one is like, if you think you're adding so much value, that probably they're not people that are better than you, right? It's a bit like you're really str- the, the best founders I've ever backed, like have made me feel uh, useless and like really try to add value to them. And whatever I do, they're already on top of it. Whereas the other way around, like just really having a sharp value add, um, really, really important to actually justify existence in the cap table. Jorge, with that perfect agreement between all three of us, let's go into the quick fire round. Quick fire round. Quick fire round. First question is, so what is the most counterintuitive thing you've learned since you started Angel Invest? This also applies to, to venture capital, but the most counterintuitive thing I've learned is how much of a sales job it actually is. We do investing, which should, you know, it's about identifying the best companies. Before I started doing this, I felt, or I thought that it would be a lot about thinking and, you know, fighting, you know, the, the needle in the haystack, like this is a good company and no one else knows this, uh, you know, being smart. And, and obviously that is a, an important facet of the job, but at the same time, if you sort of on the one hand have someone who is really good at selling and networking, but like almost no understanding of what a good founder looks like or what a good business looks like. And then you have someone who is really good at, at assessing people and business models, but sucks at selling and, and networking. This person will do much better, like the, the, the first person. I mean, just because so much of, of the job is, is knowing which deals you should look at, the network is, is a great way to, to do that. So you need to be able to, to network. And another part of the job is getting into the cap table, which is ultimately about sales, right? Any good salesperson will tell you that you don't want to sell crap, right? You want to sell good stuff. So you want to sell your actual value add, which does bring value to the company, but you are still selling. And I, I, I just think that it's, it's weird that it's like that, but it definitely is. Second one, what would be your top tip to angels wanting to do more international investments? I think going international is hard. Uh, and if you just sort of uh, flag to the world, hey, I want to do investments globally, uh, and you start sort of reaching out to find it randomly all over the globe, the deals that you will see, and then so even more so the deals that you will ultimately be able to invest in, will be the ones that everyone else passed on, which is, of course, not, not what you want, right? So a few pieces of advice I would think. One is just find a leash. Uh, so a sector you know really well, uh, whether it's gaming, fintech, climate, whatever, it will make you better at assessing deals, uh, and it will also get you better access to deals because you build a brand of someone that knows that industry, and, and also you'll be able to add more value to the company. It can also be focused on the geography. Here's a city I want to be, a, you know, I want to invest there. Uh, so spend time there, get to know the people. Uh, ultimately, that will become self-sustained, and, and people will start sort of seeing you as someone worth having as an investor. I think it's important to be clear about your value add. Again, uh, we talked about this a lot, but like, why should founders have your other cap civil, even if it's a founder in a different ecosystem? And then I think it's important to find allies that are local. So if I want to invest in Madrid, I want to find like who are the angels that invest in Madrid, uh, who are the VCs that are based there, and, and make sure that you also are value add to them in terms of uh, insights or deals or other things. And final one. What advice would you give to your own 10-year younger self if you only had 30 seconds? The advice would be that compounding is extremely powerful. I, I don't think I appreciated that properly 10 years ago, but if, if you have something, whether it's you know how good you are at a job or a business that's growing 30, 40, 50% a year, uh, even if it's from a small base, that is going to become very big if it is actually exponential uh, at some point. So I think my advice would be to sort of keep doing what you're doing and become better, better at it. And ultimately that will compound. And you don't see it on a month by month basis, but you will see it over the years. Really, really love this. Sometimes it goes counter to um, impatience. When you're young, you're impatient. So maybe you're not stuck to doing what you're really good at. Thanks for joining us, Bjarke. I mean, quite unique perspectives. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Super Angel Podcast, the go-to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Angel LP Syndicate at eu.vc. And if you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. And now, some words from our beloved sponsor. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Vaban's end-to-end platform automates your back office so you can focus on what matters, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. 
Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and they've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, Vaban will be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on the Vaban platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investment for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. If you'd like to learn more, please check out www.vaban.io forward slash EUVC. You've been touched by an angel, girl.